All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. My name is Scott Lundy. I'm going to be a moderator for our session tonight on vasectomy. I'm a provider and I see patients on the east side of Cleveland at the Beachwood Family Health Center. Today, we're joined by two experts in the area of vasectomy. First is Dr. Sarah Vidge. She practices primarily at main campus and on the west side at the Avon Richard E. Jacobs Family Health Center. She's a fellowship trained expert in men's health, male infertility, and vasectomy. We're also joined by Dr. Neil Park. He's also a fellowship trained expert in men's health, male infertility, and vasectomy. And he practices primarily on the south side at Fairlawn, in Medina, and at Akron General. So tonight we'll be presenting some basic information and overview about vasectomy. And then afterwards, we'll have plenty of time for questions. So if you have any questions, please feel free to submit them to the chat box and we'll get to as many as we can in the time that we have. So with that, I'll turn the mic over to Dr. Park. Thanks, Dr. Lundy, and thank you all for attending tonight's uh, event. Next slide. So just to briefly go over what a vasectomy is, uh, it is a male sterilization procedure. This means that the vas deferens, which is the tube that carries sperm from the testicle, is being occluded. This is considered a permanent uh, form of contraception. It's typically an outpatient, so me that means it's uh, you go home the same day, uh, and it's done under local anesthesia, so with some numbing medication, uh, but there are some exceptions to this. Uh, you know, there is an option for, for men to, to do it under a twilight if necessary, but most frequently is done in the office awake uh, where patients are able to drive themselves. It takes less than 10 minutes and it is the most common, if not one of the most common procedures done in the United States with over 500,000 being performed. And of course, it's an extremely effective uh, form of birth control. Next slide. So here we have a graphic um, going over the male anatomy and what exactly a vasectomy is. So it is a common misconception for, for many men uh, that a vasectomy is the same thing as castration uh, or being neutered, uh, but that clearly is not the case. And, and you can see in this picture here uh, where the vas deferens, uh, which is the tube connected to the testicle uh, where sperm travels through is being occluded. So the testicles themselves remain intact and are not uh, affected or disrupted. It is only the tube that carries the sperm uh, which is being occluded. Next slide. Here we have another uh, anatomical picture uh, looking at the male reproductive anatomy with the testicles, the vas deferens, um, and uh, the prostate and seminal vesicles. Another common question men have is, you know, if they have a vas vasectomy, will this affect their ejaculate volume or makeup? And, and this also is not the case. So the majority of the semen or ejaculate that is expelled uh, does not come from the testicle. Less than 10% of that ejaculate fluid is sperm. So after you have a vasectomy, you will still have a normal amount of ejaculate volume since the majority of the volume comes from elsewhere in the reproductive tract. Also, as you can see in the, in the slide, it's not related to uh, the bladder or urinary function. So urine, uh, or peeing is not affected. Next slide. So as many of you may already know, there are many alternatives uh, to a vasectomy uh, and our women in our lives really kind of carry the load or, or brunt uh, of making these uh, decisions when it comes to family planning. Uh, but here's a list of all the alternatives. You have condoms, a female diaphragm, short and long acting hormonal agents, IUDs, tubal ligation, uh, natural or the Do we lose him? I think we lost Dr. Park. Uh, I can I can just take over see if he gets back on. Um, so are you back, Neil? Yes. Okay, we lost you for a second at natural. Oh, okay. Oh, at natural. All right. Sorry about that. Uh, so natural or the pull out method uh, or spermaticidal agents. Now, all these various alternatives to uh, vasectomy have uh, a variety of pros and cons. 
Uh, for example, condoms, um, there is a cost associated, a recurring cost uh, to purchasing condoms for couples. Uh, hormonal agents uh, can have a, a number of uh, negative consequences just on, on women's um, uh, various uh, hormonal Hormonal, hormonally, as well as mood swings and, and various other uh, negative consequences. IUDs uh, can also cause pain, uh, can be dislodged, um, and can cause other uh, negative consequences. A tubal ligation is much more expensive than a vasectomy and, and is a lot more involved for uh, women to undergo as opposed to a vasectomy. And of course, you know, the pullout method or natural does not have the same or as high of a success rate as a vasectomy does. Next slide. So, in the in the media, uh, you may hear about some alternatives uh, to vasectomy or other forms of male contraception. Now, there, these could come in the form of pills, sprays, gels. Uh, at this time, none of these alternative forms of male contraception uh, are are F, none of them are FDA approved. Uh, and they are all considered experimental. So they're not currently being uh, used. Uh, and it may be quite some time before we find something uh, as far as that's effective and safe for men to use for contraception. Next slide. So really just to summarize uh, the last few slides, uh, what a vasectomy will not do. So vasectomy will not prevent sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, it will not immediately prevent Pregnancy, and we'll discuss this, but typically we recommend waiting 8 to 16 weeks after the vasectomy uh, to obtain a post vasectomy semen analysis before we give you the green light. Uh, a vasectomy will not cause uh, erectile dysfunction or cause changes in libido or sex drive or testosterone levels. Uh, it will not affect uh, your ejaculation volume, so the amount of fluid that comes out with orgasm, and it will not affect your orgasm. And finally, it's not going to affect uh, your ability to urinate or, or your urine flow. So next, I'll uh, hand it over to Dr. Vidge uh, to discuss the next steps. All right. Thank you, Dr. Parikh, and thanks to all of you um, for joining and to Dr. Lundy for moderating uh, this evening. So you've um, you've uh, made the decision to proceed to a vasectomy. So what can you um, what can you expect? So the first part of the process is you'll come in um, either in person or um, virtually uh, through um, you know your cell phone or computer and do a consultation. And during that consultation, um, you'll get an, some information very similar to what we're presenting today. Go over the risks and benefits, review the procedure, post procedural care. Sorry, there's a typo there. Um, and if the if the uh, visit is in person, there'll be a um, scrotal examination to make sure that we can uh, feel your vas deferens. If not, if it's virtually, we forego that. Give you an opportunity to, to ask any questions, and then um, oftentimes, you know, at checkout from that visit, you'll go ahead and schedule the procedure. Next slide. So the procedure itself. So this is a nice sort of graphic of what to expect. Um, so again, most guys are awake for this. Um, at this portion of the procedure, you've sort of um, you've done your check in with the nursing team, um, your supine or lying down on the uh, examining table in the office. Um, we do put some uh, warmed saline on the scrotum. It helps um, sort of just relax the uh, wall of the scrotum. Oftentimes you're a little nervous and cold, and so the testicles tend to kind of uh, ride high. So the warm uh, irrigation helps kind of loosen things up. And then we'll get a, a, a grip of the vas. You can see that's um, what we're showing here. This is not painful, just you know, a, a little bit, a little bit of discomfort. Uh, next one. We will then uh, inject uh, local anesthetic. We typically use lidocaine. Um, so you, again, you'll feel that initial needle stick, a little pinch and a burn, just like you're at the dentist. Um, and we numb the tissue around the entire um, vas, and then also numb the skin so that you don't feel, um, you know, the, the puncture part of the procedure. Um, so this is a little bit of a pinch and a burn, and a lot of guys will describe that as a, a very brief feeling of like you've been kicked there. So a little bit of discomfort, but it's very quick. And then um, we go ahead and open the skin, and the the sort of traditional um, technique was to use a scalpel. Now you'll hear about the no scalpel technique, which essentially just means we use a, a sharp instrument to spread the skin. It's thought to reduce pain. And then we then use an instrument to grasp the vas deferens. 
and um, pull it out of the wound. You can see that's the vase there kind of looping. It looks like a spaghetti noodle, feels like a spaghetti noodle. Um, we then sort of divide the tissue um, around it and you can see that's the sheath of the vase that's sort of dropping off. Um, this is uh, a zoomed in uh, picture here. So that the vase is just in the clamp there. And then um, we occlude the vase on both sides, um, sort of top and bottom. Um, different sur surgeons have different preferences for how they do this, generally done with either uh, little tiny metal clips or um, ties. Most, um, most of us tend to discard a small segment of the vase and then um, uh, there you can see here uh, tying off both ends. That's what this this uh, um, graphic represents. And then there's um, there are some other um, techniques uh, that can be done, but essentially it's it's all to accomplish the same goal. And then um, uh, usually one dissolvable stitch is placed in the skin just to help with uh, bleeding. And then that's the end of the procedure. Um, and then the we put a little bacitracin on the wound, and and um, you get up and get out of there. So um, this is just showing different methods of occluding or blocking sperm flow. And our society guidelines, which you know, come from panels of experts all over the world to determine sort of what's appropriate care, really leave this relatively open in terms of surgeon preference as long as it's reasonable. Um, and again, most of us use clips and um, ties. And then some folks do opt to do what's called fascial interposition, where they put a little bit of tissue in between the ends of the vase so that they can't regrow to each other. Um, that's what that middle um, photo here is showing. And then um, many of us will cauterize the lumen or the hole in the vase, which sort of seals it. Um, so you get another form of, of um, blocking sperm flow, because obviously our goal here is, is not for this, to, uh, for this thing to, to stay shut. Next slide. So uh, pain control. So uh, the majority of patients, just local anesthetic alone. Um, we do offer uh, an anxiolytic like Valium or sort of a relaxing medication um, that you can take ahead of time. Um, some surgeons do give this to all of their patients. I think um, many do it for select patients who are particularly anxious about it, have a needle phobia, you know, that kind of thing. You would take it about an hour before the procedure just to really calm your nerves. Um, for certain patients, we do offer anesthesia, whether it's a twilight, which we call a MAC or monitored um, anesthetic care, um, where you are in the operating room, but you're, you're not going to remember it. You're, you're mostly out. You're just breathing on your own versus a, a general anesthesia where you actually have a, have a breathing tube. So the reason we might offer anesthesia, um, one would be strong patient preference. They really do not want to do this in the office. Uh, that's rare, but it happens and, and we're certainly willing to accommodate. Um, the other is if a patient has a very difficult physical exam and we have a hard time feeling for the vas, you can imagine sort of doing all those steps becomes challenging. So those are the two, the two sort of most common um, reasons that you might be asleep. I, I suppose the third would be if you're having another procedure done at the same time, maybe a hernia repair, we might do it at the, at the same setting. Uh, next slide. So you're, you've made it through, um, wasn't as bad as you thought. Uh, usually the whole thing is sort of over and done in 10 minutes. Um, you're gonna go home that day. If you've taken a Valium or a similar medication, you would need a driver. Otherwise you can drive yourself home. Um, and your plan for that day and usually the couple days following is to take it easy and rest. Um, we do advise that patients ice the scrotum really as much as they can. 10 minutes on, 10 minutes off. A bag of frozen peas, you might hear that or see it on the internet, works really well, sort of molds to the scrotum. Um, and then Tylenol and um, Advil uh, generally recommend sort of alternating those um, uh, as needed. We do advise that you talk to your individual surgeon about their recommendations for pain control. Um, some have a preference against Advil. Again, it's just sort of uh, individual preference based on your experience. Um, scrotal support, which basically just means tight underwear. So some guys opt to wear a jock strap, um, others just a, a boxer uh, brief, you know, a tighter underwear. Um, and that's really important in the first, first few days and some opt to wear a, a little bit longer. Time off work varies a lot based on what you do. Um, if, if you have a very um, manual labor type job that requires a lot of sort of vigorous activity and heavy lifting, you probably should refrain, refrain for a week. Desk work, you could go back the following day. We generally recommend um, no sexual activity for a week and then about a week off of, again, vigorous activity like running, um, you know, heavy weightlifting, that kind of thing. 
And then really important, um, you know, Dr. Park mentioned you're not sterile walking out of the office that day. The reason for that is, is if you look back, if you think back to the diagram of the male anatomy, there are sperm that actually are just sitting downstream from where the tube is cut. And those have to be released with several ejaculations after the procedure. So you can cause a pregnancy after this. Um, we repeat a semen test at three months for that reason. And at that point, that's when you would be cleared based on the findings. Next slide. Um, so what to expect when you go home? Um, a little bit of bruising, you know, sort of black and blue scrotum is not uncommon. Um, pretty much everybody will have some degree of swelling um, of the scrotum. And that's again, why ice is really important in that supportive underwear. Um, you'll be a little sore. You sort of know, know something happened, but I'd say most patients probably don't really need any pain medicine. Um, and you may feel as things settle out and the swelling sort of um, subsides that you feel a little bit, of, a little lump at the vasectomy site, which is from the work that we did and, and really is there uh, intentionally to prevent sperm flow. Next slide. So the semen test, really important. Unfortunately, the um, compliance with following up on this um, tends to be pretty low. If you look at most studies, about 50% of male patients follow through with this piece of it, despite our best efforts. Um, the reason for this is we want to detect the very, very few failures. Um, so what this involves for you is um, providing a specimen at home, a semen specimen, um, just by masturbation into a clean um, specimen cup and bringing it in within one hour to our andrology labs. You also have the option of providing the specimen on site. They have collection rooms for this reason. In our system, you do need an appointment for, uh, for both of these uh, methods. And then it's usually within 24 hours, you'll, um, you should get notification from the office that, that your procedure was a success or not. And the um, definition of success is either zero sperm um, or uh, essentially anything less than 100,000 non-moving sperm. So um, that's uh, our sort of defined cutoff, again, by our guidelines based on a large body of literature that anything below 100,000 non-moving sperm, you're considered sterile. If there's modal sperm, it is not a success and you need to follow the recommendations of your surgeon. So complications, so everybody wants to know about this. So there's a small percentage of patients, probably less than 5% that really get substantial bruising and swelling. So their scrotum really, you know, kind of blows up. Um, you know, I've seen guys where it is, you know, softball size or, or larger. Um, I've never had to reoperate. So it's really rare that we have to go back in and drain any of this out. Um, it just takes time to resolve. And so again, it's just sort of a prolonged period of icing and um, scrotal support and maybe a little more prolonged period of rest. Fortunately, this is uncommon. Hematoma is a collection of blood, which may lead to the, the first thing I mentioned. Um, so that would be if a little you know, blood vessel breaks open after the, at the time of the procedure or, or afterwards. And again, these are almost exclusively managed um, conservatively where it would just with time, uh, ice, supportive underwear, et cetera. Infection, um, you can have a wound infection, really rare. These are tiny wounds, but it, it can happen. Or an epididymitis, which is an infectious process in the epididymis, which is your sperm storage structure. And that usually presents as, as sort of new onset pain, you know, six, eight, 12 weeks after the procedure. And an ultrasound will confirm this diagnosis and it's treated with antibiotics and generally resolves. Um, post vasectomy pain syndrome. Um, so this is a, an, an unfortunate, but very, very rare outcome where um, guy, the guy basically has persistent pain um, in, the, in the, usually they describe it in the testicles after a vasectomy. And we don't really understand the etiology for it well. Um, we do have treatments for it. And fortunately, it's pretty rare, um, depending on the study you look at, it's probably about one to 2% of patients um, will develop some degree of pain um, you know, following the procedure. And again, we do have treatments for that. So early failure and late failure. So early failure essentially means you come in for that semen test and you've got sperm. So um, that's you know generally a, a technical failure of the procedure. It, it's also possible that those two ends can essentially find each other in what we call fistulize and the sperm starts um, flowing again. This is again why we check that semen analysis so we can capture that and, and redo the surgery, um, you know, redo the procedure. And many of us will elect to do that uh, in the operating room, just to you know, make sure we have, you know, don't don't need to be ginger at all, and really sort of um, ensure that we've, uh, you know, it can be a, a, the final time. And then late failure is um, the idea that uh, 
or, or the phenomenon where the likely the VAS sort of find each other again se several years later. So it's hard to measure the rate of this um, because we don't check semen analyses on guys, you know, for, for life. Um, but the, the late failure rate is extremely low. If you look at overall success rate of this procedure, it's over 99%. That, you know, again, assumes that you had that negative post vasectomy semen test. So complication rates overall relatively uncommon. And then just sort of some myths that are out there. Again, if you do your Googling, um, there was um, uh, some panic uh, a few years ago that, that vasectomy led to an increased risk of prostate cancer that's been completely debunked. Um, really no relationship with cardiovascular disease. Um, sexual dysfunction, again, a lot of patients ask about that and Dr. Parra kind of talked again, you know, seeing the anatomy. Um, this is really just, you know, obstruction to the flow of sperm. It does not cause a change in sexual function. Um, and hormonal changes, you know, testosterone is produced by the testicle, but the production of testosterone is unchanged independent of whether you're, you're sterile or not. So no increased risk of any of these things, fortunately. Next slide. So fertility after vasectomy. So you decide to get a vasectomy and, and you know, life changes, you have regret, you change your mind. Um, there are options. So it is thought to be, you know, it is meant to be permanent sterilization. We don't do it with the, um, the plan in mind to have children later, but, um, you know, life is complicated and things happen. And so if that does come up, we do have options. Um, the first of which is a vasectomy reversal. So this is a surgical procedure that, that um, all three of us perform. Um, it's generally has pretty poor insurance coverage, so it's high cost um, and is not a guaranteed success. So um, that is, uh, you know, one option. Additionally, we can retrieve sperm from the testicle or, or the epididymis, the sperm storage structure after the fact to be used with assisted reproduction, like in vitro fertilization. Um, the testicles do continue to make sperm after a vasectomy, so there are, are ways to access that. And then um, donor sperm and adoption or other alternatives to growing your family after you've had a vasectomy. Next. All right, so um, that's the end of our formal um, talk. I did, um, we did put the phone number on here for scheduling. We do offer both in-person and virtual consultations. So if it's hard for you to get into the office, you can certainly do this um, virtually just to get that sort of first step out of the way. So I'll turn it back over to you, Dr. Lundy. If there's any questions. Great. Thanks so much for the excellent presentation, Dr. Vidge and Dr. Parikh. If you have questions uh, to the audience members, please feel free to place them in the chat box and we'll get to as many as we can. We'll go ahead and start with a question that came in um, that uh, I think is important to answer. Is it possible to store sperm specimen before you have a vasectomy as another option for uh, um, just a safety net? in case you will change your mind later on. I can take that one. So um, absolutely possible, um, uh, you know, relatively straightforward to cryopreserve or freeze sperm. Um, it, it also tends to be expensive and you have a upfront cost and then an annual cost for as long as you bank it. Um, I do have patients that ask about this. It's a, it's a, a you know, smaller percentage for sure. Um, and the only thing I would say to that is if you're, if you're really on the fence, then I would just wait and allow yourself to make a, a, a sort of more um, defined decision. Um, some people just want the peace of mind, but really have decided they're done with, you know, done having children and 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 want sperm in the bank, and that's completely fine. Um, again, it's just a, it's really just a matter of cost. And Dr. Vidge, is that sperm uh, able to be used for a natural conception, or does it require more advanced techniques? Yeah, so important point, it, it cannot be used for a natural, it cannot be used for insemination, um, uh, artificial insemination. It has to be used for in vitro fertilization uh, generally. There's some some uh, patients who have high sperm counts where we can do an insemination, um, but that that um, is rare. So it's generally, um, you know, pretty expensive to have a child through that mechanism. But, you know, uh, this is completely the patient's decision, really. Great. Uh, next question for either of you, um, how much does a vasectomy cost? Is it covered by insurance? I don't know if we lost Dr. Parr. Question, Dr. Dr. Lundy. Can you hear us? Right there. Yep. 
Good question, Dr. Lundy. As far as cost of a vasectomy, uh, fortunately, uh, vasectomy is something that's covered by insurance. Uh, so it's something that patients just don't necessarily need to uh, really worry about. Um, almost all uh, insurance carriers cover the cost of the vasectomy. Great. Um, we touched on this a little bit, but uh, can either of you speak to um, if if men change their mind later on, uh, what are the options available and what are the success rates with those options? So Dr. Vich touched on this during her, her talk, but really uh, the two options for a biologic child uh, include uh, getting sperm directly from the testicle or epididymis through a sperm extraction. So that's a small needle that's inserted into the epididymis and sperm is extracted and can be used for in vitro fertilization purposes um, or a vasectomy reversal, uh, which is a bit more involved than a vasectomy, uh, which is typically done in the office. Uh, a vasectomy reversal uh, does require anesthesia and is done in the operating room and does take uh, about two hours uh, to perform. But those are the two main options um, for after a vasectomy. Great. Um, we touched on this a little bit already, but uh, there was a question that came in about when can I know if the vasectomy worked? So if you could just speak a little bit more about the timeline and um, how many men are successful at that first check and how many need to go on to next checks. Yeah, so I um, went over this briefly. So um, there are sperm downstream from where we divide the vas. And so the idea of waiting is to wait until those sperm get cleared. And the only way they get cleared with an, is with an ejaculation. Some men will clear those sperm very quickly in one or two ejaculations. Others, it might take 20, 30, 50. So instead of getting into, um, uh, you know, quantity of ejaculations, um, we tend to just talk about time and the great majority of men will have cleared by three months. So that's generally my preference. And I think Dr. Parks um, and Dr. Lundy's as well. Um, so you're sort of trying to spare them a um, second procedure. If I have a guy that's like clearly really anxious to stop using another form of birth control, you know, I can, I'll tell him you can certainly get it done sooner. Um, if you haven't quite reached that 100,000 number, you're not going to be sterile. We'll have to repeat it. So there are urologists who do six weeks. There are some who actually um, will ask for two different specimens. Um, that is a, a relatively common practice as well. So there's some surgeon preference here, um, and I would just you know ensure that on the day of your procedure you clarify what your surgeon's um, pathway is post procedure. All right. Does anybody have any other questions that we can answer for you this evening before we, uh, looks like we'll end a little bit early. Okay, well, I'd like to thank both of our panelists for their time and their expertise. Dr. Vidge and Dr. Parikh, you were fantastic. Um, we're happy to uh, hear from anyone with further questions or to give our office a call for scheduling. Again, that number is on the screen now. And we'll continue to do these informational sessions and look forward to seeing you in the future. Thank you all very much and have a good night.